Hello and welcome to the Flukoma podcast. Today I'm talking with Tomomi Adachi, who is a performer, composer, sound poet and installation artist currently based in Japan. Uh, Tomomi has performed all over the world with many different artists. His practice spans a wide range of forms from experimental voice and electronics improvisation to site-specific performances and installations, from theatrical and visual works to instrument making. So today we'll be learning more about his creative process, the ways in which he makes use of machine learning in his creative work, and also his approach to instrument design. So Tomomi, hello, and thank you for talking with me today. Hello. So thank you so much for your invitation. And yep. hello, everyone. You're quite welcome. Um, so perhaps you could begin by uh, telling us how you got into the world of music. Okay, so maybe I should start the story when I was 14 years old or something like that. Okay, so when I was 14 years old, so just I decided I would be a composer at that time. And you know, it's a 14 years old is something the such kind of crazy time for everyone. And actually, so I'm, I have to say, so I didn't have any musical background. And actually, it is still now, it's an important thing for me. So I didn't have any special education about on music. Uh, actually, when I was around 11 years old, just I studied, I learned the piano just one year or something like that. And actually, I didn't like it, to be honest. But then, you know, just by chance, I listened to music of uh, Stravinsky or Bella Bartok. This is also, these are also typical, I think. And okay. So this is something I have to do. And just, uh, you know, it, it came and I decided. So I would be first composer because, uh, okay. So it, you know, it was. I was 14 years old, and at that time already, I didn't have any chance to be pianist, for example, or a violinist. <laughs> okay, so composer would be one possibility. But even that, so soon I tried many instruments, and I studied some music, and soon I figured that out. So actually, I didn't have any musical talent. And okay, what I should do? And then already I decided and I didn't want to give up. So the my direction was and is still it's uh, to change the idea of music. What is the music? I change it and then I could be a musician. And this is something my basic way and uh, even university just uh, I studied uh, philosophy and i didn't study in i yeah and, and i didn't choose the way to get any special technique on music special education for music and after i graduated uh, university so i started to commit into some concert and especially the time john cage was really really important for me and for example yeah actually my first my professional career was an uh, interpreter of music of John Cage. And yes, and just I expanded somehow the way to how to make my own art. And important thing is I don't care which material I use, maybe we discuss later. And but for me, it is still somehow many cases I say I'm making music and still I'm making music. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so talking about John Cage, who um, yep. obviously uh, you've put a lot of his works um, over in Japan and uh, performed a lot of his pieces. We'll, we'll we'll get back to that later. And uh, and saying that, so you tried a few musical instruments, but found you didn't um, yeah. sort of stick to many of them. But you do, of course, have a very yeah, talented actually... vocalist. Okay, actually, voice is something I found at the last. Because uh, I all actually self education and also a few experiences in school band. In fact, I played percussion and I played piano and violin and flute, etc. But always I feel I felt you know if 
the, there are a lot of good musicians on these instruments, you know, and for example, I'm, I'm quite serious about percussions, but you know, if you see, there are a lot of great percussionists and I thought it is totally impossible. And uh, I'm not so patient person to practice every day, unfortunately. And okay. And then actually the voice came quite late. Uh, maybe I started to use voice when I was 19 years old or, old or something like that. And that time I was playing uh, uh, drums and of course electronics already. I tried to do something. It's, I was using much track tape recorder and on the stage and uh, I was making some real time tape crutch. But always my mouth is free, you know, and I'm operating something. I'm playing drums, but it's okay. I can add something on voice. And that's, this is why I started. And also then I figured out it's, for example, vocal processing, uh, use effector. So I bought effectors for tape crutch, but soon, okay. So to connect microphone to them. And that is the most interesting for me. And okay, so this, this direction was beginning. Okay, electronics came first. And this, after that, so I thought my voice is really interesting material to, for voice processing and for electronics. And still, I'm really fascinated with the combination between electronics and voice. Hmm. And as we'll be discussing later, taking that even further with uh, integrating it into a machine learning system, mm -hmm. um, which, we, which we'll be talking yes. about. Um, so you said that, uh, yeah, your your kind of initial kind of motivation or approach was to to change the idea of music, and 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 much of your practice does go beyond what's commonly considered as music. Mm -hmm. um, so as is the case with with many artists who engage with technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence, you pursue many different types of activities and practices in your work. So you've got improvisation, but you've also done 3D printing, um, mm -hmm. visual poetry, just to name a few. Um, so I mean, we've already kind of skirted around it, um, but I wonder if perhaps at a macroscopic level, um, are there any recurring themes or approaches um, that you may think run through your creative work that would perhaps allow us to gain a better idea of what it is that you do? Mm -hmm. Probably, for example, the concept of intermediary is always something important for my, I don't say all, but almost all, almost all practices, somehow I'm feeling that idea of intermediate. And intermediate, as you know, it's uh, somehow defined by Dick Higgins of Fluxus. And you find something in between two, two media. And in this meaning, for example, I'm doing a lot about uh, visual poetry and the sound poetry thing. And for example, sound poetry is uh, intermediate between poetry, literature, and music. And you really cannot uh, decide this sound poetry is music or literature and this uh, concept is somehow always important for me and also at the same time you know if i see something i i think i i, I sh i'm trying to always pay attention what other artists are doing and but sometimes i feel kind of void void i don't know if the void is a proper word something emptiness and yes, yeah, somebody is missing this world. And why people don't do that? And just I decide I do it by myself. And this is somehow always a way I'm making art. And in, yeah, still in the media, it's uh, somehow it's easy because uh, actually the concept of intermediate by Dick Higgins was quite a static, I feel. And not really the way I'm thinking, but actually to explain what I'm doing 
it's uh it's yeah i think it's a term intermediate is uh, something really good term to explain what i'm doing mm. yeah no that's really interesting so yeah the, the kind of tension that can arise between the uh, merging of different art forms and uh, you know it sounds like a very rich kind of place to to deploy one's work um, yeah and uh, so another thing is uh Okay, I'm making, I say I'm making music, but you know, it's a sound is not my main interest. And this is a fire, for example. So imagine the music without sound. This is always interesting. And just, actually, it is possible. And how, for example, so any, for example, visual element you can treat as uh, the material of music. And this, and the, okay, maybe it's, it's, it's called intermedia. And this is a somehow, yeah, I really like to work with such way. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. To, and yeah, this idea of the sound not necessarily being the kind of main interesting. It's something that I notably want to get back to when, uh, we're talking with, uh, talking about your AI performance piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Perhaps just before that, uh, to sort of finish off to get a kind of rounded uh, situational idea of, of your practice. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, was that, uh, so in 2021, uh, you wrote a chapter in Nicholas uh, Commons' book, Handmade Electronic Music, called A History of Japanese Hacking and DIY mm -hmm, Music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was a really fascinating read because I'm, I'm don't have that much knowledge about um, the Japanese hacking scene. Um, so I wondered if, um, well, yeah, I wondered how or if um, you place your own work in this history. Um, mm -hmm. And specifically, how do you conceive of terms like hacking and punk? Uh, what kind of roles would they play in your work? Mm -hmm. uh, especially the punk is important idea for me like intermediate because the punk is uh, say negation of technique one aspect is you know so i didn't have any professional musical education and when how i make music actually punk also it's uh, the same as john case music for me punk music was really important Okay, just uh, buy electric guitar and make some some noise, and it could be music, and that is a great idea. And so always I'm thinking. Also, I immediately start to think about the idea of punk in the history of experimental music. Uh, for example, it is uh, quite clear the connection of the punk and Kony Rascardio, for example, and. Yes, so in I think it's uh, still it's my one of my attitude is uh, you can explain like punk, okay. So I we I don't need to sophistication. I don't need to sophisticate what I'm doing. Just do it, and if you get idea, just do it. And you know this uh, spirit of DIY. You know, it's important thing. And, and in this meaning, also you can explain this hacking because the hacking is, you know, technology. There is a lot of sophisticated technology and, but just use it. And if the, you can get something there, just use it. Why you wait? You, you need to, you don't need to do wait anything. And this attitude is a, it's important for me. And this is why, you know, I do, I don't want to hesitate to do something new thing. And okay, I don't have any technique of visual art, but just I do it. And if I can, you know, and I, I love this attitude. And it is truly, so the punk opened the door, how to do that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, perhaps to get an idea of, of yeah, how, how you kind of practically approach that. Um, yeah, I'd love to 
I'd love to hear about how you design your instruments. Um, mm. So you create objects of many different forms um, from like completely electronic circuits with your various uh, Tummermins uh, to electroacoustic instruments like the Tummer Ring um and more conceptual projects that I'll, uh, I'll get on to later but um yeah i wonder if um you could talk a bit about your process um when creating an instrument um yeah there's this i mean so you're deploy deploying quite a technical expertise um mm -hmm. but but then that it's also mixed into this very kind of diy um sort of the 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 very striking aesthetic of those tumamins which are in these kind of plastic boxes um yeah uh, yeah yeah i wonder if you could um talk a bit about your uh, process when when creating an instrument for example it's uh, if i talk about tumamin it's the uh, first version i made it when i was uh, 22 years old or something like that but okay so actually i had some background about electronics because uh, it was my hobby when i was uh, elementary school student and i was i actually constructed some circuitry with ic and it was hobby and i quit it but after for example it's another important name for me was uh, david tudor and david tudor was you know and i listened to his uh, CD when I was uh, 21 years old or something, 20 years old or something like that. And I really surprised how he could make such beautiful sounds. And I learned, okay, so he built the circuit by himself. And at that moment, I really didn't understand what exactly he did. But okay, maybe I can do it because uh, I had some, no I had some knowledge and I bought some textbook about the, uh, electronics but for hobby because still i really don't understand what exactly happening inside but you can make sound and if it, the sound is cool it's okay what's wrong and you know and somehow i start to understand what is happening inside but always it is you can say it is hacking because how to you know the use of electronics my interest is how to lose your control and not per perfect control is not my interest this is why i didn't buy any electronic comp instrument because it's uh, you know it's something you can control all sound and how you can make some balance uncontrollable element and but also, you know, it shouldn't be just chaos for me. It's somehow I can interfere to the process. And it is something is a balance between controllable uh, uh, aspect and uncontrollable aspect. And it's just I fear that, okay, it's a, just I make the instrument by myself. It's the easiest way. And also I didn't want to carry big instrument heavy instrument and yes and that's the reason i just put everything on top of where it's where you know it's cheap and light that's all and okay so first tomomi had uh, the four keyboard i really don't need the 61 keyboard and the four keyboard somehow enough and and it's it's easy to carry and it makes some something really nice sound i have never heard and yes okay it's just i thought okay it's the way uh, i should go and also if you want to make you know new music to build instrument by yourself it's reasonable you know it it, it have to be actually Mm. And fortunately, yes, and I had a really, really basic knowledge about electronics, but it's really basic. And, you know, I think almost everyone can do that. And the difference is if you do it or not. Mm. Well, it's interesting, this idea about um, sort of riding that balance between losing control control and chaos is that something that um you find electronics lend themselves particularly to um 
or is it perhaps more sort of with your your background as being uh, as a hobbyist uh, coming having a, a good but perhaps not comprehensive uh, understanding mm -hmm. of the electronics mm -hmm. is it is it more to do with that or um could you ride that same balance with an acoustic instrument or yeah and, and you know it's also i'm right the score for professional musicians for example but even that you know still somehow i expect so they do something unexpected thing they do and they can do and actually always i feel it's you know music is happening on the stage in real time it is the most interesting moment and so this is the first thing I really like to go to small venues and listen to something. The music is happening there. And yes, in yeah, in this thing, you know, it's if you control everything, you know, it's just the, under the limitation of yourself. And that is boring, you know. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you, when I'm playing something, you know, I need some surprise. And that surprise might come from other colleagues, or other musicians on the same stage. But at the same time, I, I also want to surprise with my own instrument. Hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, life is boring. <laughs> no, definitely. And it's uh, that it's interesting because it's something that many of the musicians that have been sort of gravitating around the flucoma project it's it's that's something that lots of people seem to want to look for um especially when working with computers and you know looking for that kind of element of surprise but um i think rodrigo constanzo described it to me once as as wanting to have the excitement of of falling out of a plane with a parachute but then again Mm -hmm. you want to have a parachute because you don't want to die yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so in in the essay that i mentioned earlier um i loved one thing that you said about the uh akihabara district in tokyo um that you described as at the time being the urban temple of electronics mm -hmm. um uh you said that one might go to buy things um but you would leave with ideas mm -hmm. um so i'd love to hear about um perhaps the way uh especially when you're uh, creating your more kind of electroacoustic instruments, perhaps, um, the way that you would go about selecting objects, um, how an electronic component, uh, which is perhaps inherently not musical, how it could spark creative ideas, um, and the agency that various objects and components can have um, mm -hmm. in your process. Actually, that text, that sentence I wrote was a more actually practical thing because, you know, if you go to Akihabara, uh, you know, there is some, uh, you know, B class box and really cheap stuff. And even there is no description. Even the, the seller they don't know what exactly they are and some kind of, kind of thing and just uh, i buy i buy them because they are cheap and for example you know so i was playing uh, the interface called uh, infrared sensor shots and it has uh, the 10 infrared distance sensors on my shots my jacket and it's capture my movement and the, you know it's just actually the cue uh why i made that interface was uh, that's just one day i found very cheap distance sensors and okay it's really cheap i buy 10 and still it's all it was almost nothing and i and just i put 10 sensors on my desk what I can do. And, you know, it's somehow it's by chance because it's not like that. So I didn't make any blueprint blueprint before, but I found some cheap material and, and put it and then I find a way. And, you know, it's a, maybe kind of even dialogue and, 
And it, that is a really nice experience because, uh, you know, for example, it's, as long as I know, you know, it's in Europe that these compon components are always the same price. <laughs> but I can have a, you can find many different things and we, you don't know what exactly they are. And, and because it's a cheap, just so you can buy it and just think what I can do with them. And this kind of process is, uh, maybe it's uh, still part of capitalism, but it's quite creative. And I can, actually, I can have a changed and not like that anymore. Uh, yes, but uh, still something. And uh, I'm not living in Tokyo anymore. And this is what, yeah, I'm more talking about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. But these kind of things happened in Akihabara, and I really love it. Mm. Well, it sounds almost like kind of the same kind of approach of wanting that surprise and sort of going into this place, finding mm -hmm. these things, not really expecting or knowing exactly yeah, what you're going yeah. to find and, and yeah. taking something home that you don't know quite exactly what it's going to yeah, do. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, it's uh, also the experimental electronic, the pioneers of America in the States, New York. And they say, you know, so they found something in Canal Street and just built something from there. And mm. it's not like uh, the really academic idea. I need it. I buy, it, I, I construct it and buy it. Not like that. So I need something, some object. And it's stimulate your creativity. Hmm. It's nice. Mm. Yeah. No, I can imagine. And it's, yeah, it, 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 I can't think, um, I mean, in France, I mean, perhaps in, yeah, because I don't live in Paris, but, um, yeah, I can't think of that kind of, of, of mm. place where you could go to, yeah, because it's, yeah, all, exactly. Yeah. The electronic shops are all very, yeah, everything labeled and um, very yeah. precise boxes and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and yeah. Um, so before we move on, um, I think uh, as, whilst we're still talking about instrument design, um, it's important also to hear about some of your more conceptual projects. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, I love this series of photos I saw of, of conceptual instruments for Walter Smatic in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, so some very evocative objects that kind of yep. conjured up sort of Duchamp, Dali-esque kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm, inspirations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, w I wonder if perhaps you'd like to talk a bit about that project um, or about some of the more conceptual instruments, um, like instruments with wrong proportions or some of the collective mm -hmm. instruments you make. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so Walter Smetak is uh, kind of really inspiring for inspiring the, the source of inspirations. The last 10 years, I have to say, because the first time I listened to his music, maybe 2012. And luckily, I could involved in the project around him because he, I don't know if you know him. And, uh, but so he was a Swiss born Brazilian composer that died in the middle of the 80s, uh, already a long time ago. But, and he was a composer and also the instrument builder. And I luckily I could touch with, with some his his original instrument too, and it is something very weird stuff because it's some faces here and it's not practical at all. But he put some meanings, and even I don't I didn't understand what exactly it means but even also is I didn't need to do that just something it's instrument is not only for make sound actually you know it's if you see the history it's, it has many symbolic meanings instrument heart and somehow maybe we can th think uh something the instruments new instrument in that way so it's not to make sound okay it's instrument you can make sound but 
So that's the series of my series of conceptual instrument is more like, you know, combine, how to combine instrument, but almost visually and somehow even looks like symbolic. And this was, uh, yeah, I say it's, it's kind of conceptual art, and but deeply inspired by Walter's metal. And Walter's also another interesting uh, practice by Walter Smetak was uh, he called it collective instrument, instrument played by many people at the same time. And actually it's uh, some ethnic music had it, has it, uh, but very, very rare, you know. Some people play uh, some instrument at the same time, but it's somehow interesting idea about what is the music to play one instrument with some people and otherwise you cannot make sound and so i was following that idea and still i'm making some instrument uh, around this concept and this is interesting because of how you connect the music to community and actually originally music it was always from community but maybe not now and I don't criticize it at all, actually. Also, my music is somehow isolated in any community, maybe. But also, it's somehow interesting idea. If you consider about the music of Christian Wolf or Cornelia Scardio, they had uh, some idea music really conscious with some people to make music together. And it's not the realization, the concept of composer. And also it is not expression of, it's, it is not personal expression. It's something different. So the music could be the medium that people work together. And even you can put the same idea on, on instrument. When to play the instrument, so some people need to calm and to pay attention what other people do. And this is a beautiful idea. And uh, Walter Smetak was uh, the person so, who invented this idea. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, it, kind of, it makes me think of um, one project uh, uh, by Alice Eldridge and Chris Kiefer, who used some of the flucoma tools. Um, and they, uh, they used it, yeah, to, to, so the project was called Feedback Cello. And, uh, so Alice is on a cello with various pickups under the strings and, 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 um, and Chris is, has this kind of modular setup. But it's mm. really, they, they were very, like very, it was very important to understand that they weren't two musicians playing in a duo on, on something. This system um, with this kind of circular feedback with mm -hmm. machine learning within it was really a, sh a shared instrument. And it was something that mm -hmm. they were steering together. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I feel that um, electronics and, and, and kind of AI technologies and stuff are really kind of opening perspectives towards that kind of approach and and yeah this idea of the instrument that would bring communities together to kind of work yeah. together on this thing yeah it's a, it's a really really yeah i agree electronics actually it's a work in that way very well mm, yeah great um so instrument design is a big part of the flucoma project um but i'd now I'd like to steer the conversation towards another big uh, aspect of the Flucoma ecosystem, um, which is, of course, using technologies like artificial intelligence, um, mm -hmm. machine learning and listening in, in music. Um, so you have one particular project uh, called Voices from AI in Experimental Improvisation uh, with Andreas Tsialoka and Marcello uh, Lusana. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a project that uh, deals with uh, this directly. Uh, so I wonder if first uh, you could describe the project and perhaps explain some of its inner workings. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I'm not really a coder. And for example, I cannot make programming for AI. 
And so this is why we made some group, one group with uh, Andreas and Marcello. And okay, the concept of that project was, you know, I'm a voice performer and I use a lot of extended techniques. And But, you know, at the same time, a, for AI technologies, it's a voice is always really important aspect and machine learning is a it's a one of the main purpose is listen to what people are speaking and okay so this maybe we can apply to totally another way and actually the first uh, thing was i really surprised uh, public when uh, the that the wavenet was published and okay, now we can do such thing. And they publish their kind of a copy of Chopin and they generated the audio file sounded like Chopin directly. So, you know, that just, I thought it, wow. But why they are making Chopin? What is the meaning? So we have already Chopin. Of course, I understand why they need to do that. But okay, so maybe more we can make use this technology the way more useless or not to create any money. And okay, so the make the avatar of myself. It is something only because, you know, I'm playing, I, as improviser, I play so many musicians. I can play anyone, but so I cannot play one person. It's me. And okay. If I use new technology, okay. So it's, I can do it. I cannot do it without that technology. It is what I want to do. And okay. So I, AI, we use AI and build my copy. It's, it's conceptual level and actually practically really not, but conceptual level like that. And first I prepared something nearly 10 years. No, no, no. 10 hours, 10 hour voice recording of my improvisation. It was really huge work, <laughs> of course. And then first WebNet, not, it was not really only WebNet. I used some, we used some algorithms, but so WebNet regenerated my voice. And we got something samples sounded like me, but not exactly. Almost it sounded like noise, really noise, because uh, my voice has a really wide range. And yes, but so we had a big set of samples and Jeroha programmed the algorithm program and it listened to my improvisation in real time and predict what I will do the next. And that's that we called it the Tomomi bot, that bot uh call and play the sample the which is uh, similar to what i will do the next and conceptually it is something i'm playing with myself and you know it's immediately we have some question and the biggest one was you know what i'm doing is a so-called free improvisation and predict free improvisation what exactly it means and but and also you know we really don't know how ai understand what i'm doing but you know just at some point okay so i can play with this guy and it so just uh, we made some uh, small adjustment and you know it's always necessary and but some point i i thought okay this really i can perform together and this is a performance i'm doing with tomomi bot and but there is some version but it's the next step was actually important part was then i imitate what tomomi bot is doing and really i if i can understand what what ai is thinking 
It is the next step. And also imitates the voice. Originally, the voice was generated by my voice and it, the AI imitated me and then I imitated. And this kind of mutual, <laughs> mutual exchange, it is really important. And, you know, it's people just um, use AI to generate the imitation of what human do, being did. And actually, it's we should imitate them in the next step. Mm. And and this is why I really repeat it. And the performance with the same algorithm. And also, it's uh, another potential uh another possibility of the webnet was uh, you know you can for example synthesize the voice uh just between my voice and the cat meow for example actually we did it and you know 50 percent of my voice and the cat now 50 percent and for ai it's same for webnet it's same and just to make something we really don't distinguish you what is it and this, that was a really interesting uh, process, and uh, yes, and that is uh, our our, our uh, direction was you know kind of make mutual exchange between human beings and AI. Mm -hmm. No, that's really interesting because um, yes, it, it's, as as you say, the the kind of configurations and 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 um the trainings that a, a, a neural network can have um are, are, are always obviously very opaque to to the human being it's it's not mm -hmm. something that we can readily understand um and yeah this this idea of of, of uh engaging aesthetically with with what it's going to to give you as being a kind of a, a means of understanding like the configuration of that system um i think that's a really powerful idea and it's it's something mm -hmm. that uh yeah yeah that's um yeah because in the flucoma project there are some objects for example like uh dimensionality reduction objects that take for example an audio file that's got hundreds or thousands of different yeah, yeah. descriptors um, and yeah, and yeah. kind of crunches them down into a mm. sort of human readable number of dimensions two or three dimensions you know mm. um but yeah no this is another really kind of interesting approach to to kind of allowing us to kind of um tangibly or kind of aesthetically at least engage with with uh data that's 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 ununderstandable for a, for a human being. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, a, it's a really yep. interesting yep. approach. Um, because of form, sorry, so yeah, because yeah. for me, it's also this AI project. It's uh, somehow I consider it is a part of uh, the idea of uh, the communication with non-humans. And for example, so the last year, so I had uh, some project in pound in germany the countryside and i practiced the improvisation with the frogs and in the pond and you know so they just start to make sound but we actually i didn't understand how and okay so i tried to communicate with them and actually the some um, one week i did it and somehow i they really did start to react to me and of course it's they are not playing music but still you know i found something connection with them and maybe it seems like because evidently they some of them imitated me and responded the response to me and this kind of communication is uh yes i'm very very interested in this uh, the communication between humans and non-humans and also this is uh, ai is one or for me it's uh, one agency non-human agency mm. yeah no, it's, it's it's a really interesting project um one thing that uh arose from it as well when i was reading um on your website you're talking about it um so 
thinking back to earlier when you were talking about the sound not necessarily being the 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 main kind of interest um in some of your approaches um when you were talking about this project uh you explained that um the program can learn from every sound source and type and you mm. give an example in the form of a question uh, you say what is the musical dramaturgy of orchestra music or war videos from U youtube Mm. So I'm really fascinated by uh, by the question and the way in which um, you suggest that Tomomibot um, could offer a means of taking any sound document and then looking at it from a certain perspective. So here mm -hmm. it seems that you're not just interested in the sound document itself, the sound, mm -hmm. but also the perspective from which um, it's being regarded. So um, I wonder, yeah, if you could talk more about sound sources and how you create uh, curate them um be it orchestral music war videos or recordings of your own mm -hmm. performances and the ways in which you you approach them um what perspectives can one take um and how would you compare the perspective of of a machine learning algorithm and that of a performer for example you know, it's, for me, it's a really important thing is I actually really cannot understand what AI, what is the understanding of AI. And, you know, it's, uh, the, there is, okay, I understand somehow algorithm and the mapping on the 13th dimension space. Okay. But, okay. How you, we can understand 13th dimension space and this is something that all the beyond our perception and they have a perspective but at the same time okay we really cannot understand how they are working but still we can improvise together why and how it is possible and yes i'm i'm pretty sure so people think it is a really clearly some relationship is it is not randomness at all it's some relationship between me and the tomorrow what is happening on the stage and you know it's our ability of understanding something you know it's even we can imagine something happening in the 13th dimension space and that way and it's and actually even i really ex ex expect so that's the part you say it's perspective and the perspective is very far from ourselves but still maybe we can communicate somehow and okay for example it's one day so we needed to communicate with aliens maybe and how we can communicate with aliens and this is something similar concept and yes it is a, we really needed to prepare it i think <laughs> yeah yeah and this is you know it's imagination is something relatively wider than understanding and we can it was great we can we could imagine so what is happening in tomomi bot Mm. Yeah, that kind of, um, you know, it brings to mind the, I don't know if it's an expression or, uh, but the idea of, uh, yeah, if a, if a lion were able to speak our language, we still mm. wouldn't be able to understand it because mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. just so far removed from, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's really interesting. And I think this kind of approach, um, with, uh, to, to using artificial intelligence and, and engaging with the algorithms is, is something that's really valuable and, and, um, that is perhaps sadly a bit overlooked by some of, um, the hard science fields. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think this kind of artistic and aesthetic way of engaging with these algorithms is something that could, that, that's really useful and, um, that, that brings a lot. Um, yeah, no, but it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating project. Um, thank you for talking thank about you. it. Um, so, uh, we've heard in depth about your approach to instrument design and working with artificial intelligence, but, um, 
as we've discussed, your practice takes many other forms. So perhaps to finish, we could have a few broader questions about some of the other um, aspects of your practice. Um, so first, as well as being an instrument designer and a performer, you're also a composer. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've written pieces for a multitude of instrumental configurations and sometimes large numbers of performers. So I wonder how do you approach um, working with other musicians and translating your musical ideas so that they can be interpreted by others? You know, it's uh, I don't choose a really specific medium to express express my idea and you know and actually I'm you know as I told you at the beginning at the beginning so the beginning was i was uh, shocked with the music of igor stravinsky and bella bardock such old fashion music and yes and still on the way for example still i can work in the, the framework of performer composer and even you know i write really conventional western style notation in it's just by the case if it is i feel it's uh it works i write it and uh, nothing wrong about it and you know it's uh then for example if i write music to other person other people Already I mentioned, I talked about it. It is something music is belong to the place and the space and the players, performers, and not exactly composers. And when, you know, there is some variant because also I perform by myself. And if really I, I, the idea, concept of music really, I, felt I couldn't compare, convey them to other person. I perform by myself. And but the other case, okay, so it's just something I provide some the cue of think about it. What is it? And this is a role of composer in this case. And it's actually it's different thing. And for example, you know, it's composed for myself and other things. It's actually I really distinguish them. And and it's and then if some other performers praise my piece, it is actually their music. It is what I'm feeling always. And it's not they are not transporter of my idea and my idea is still there but it's they have to make music from from my score and it is i actually i don't care if the the outcome is very far from my idea okay so to me to be honest so i care a little bit but <laughs> uh if they perform another way it's okay it's if they are convinced about it and yes i make different approach hmm. well it's it's really interesting to hear you use for example the the terminology of a, a cue because um, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 typically how we we kind of conceive of engaging with uh, an artificial intelligence that um, uh -huh, uh, we give yeah, it cues yeah. and then, and so we give it an initial idea and cues and then it will go and create something and uh, mm. yeah, it's it's interesting to to hear you use those terms. Um, so you talked about uh, the music belonging to uh, the place and the space um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. existing within that moment. I couldn't agree more. Um, and so you've also created a number of site-specific uh, mm -hmm, pieces mm -hmm. and uh, installations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I'd love to hear more about how you how you play with space in your work, um, how and why you may choose uh, or be led to appropriate um, a certain location and, and the role that the space and, and the place you're in mm -hmm. plays in your work. Yeah, I like to watch story the musicians <laughs> because uh, I feel, you know, they have some fr more freedoms. And also, it is a natural thing for me. So 
if you play that if you say it is the same music but if you play it just different places it's different music and it, it's a natural thing because your perception is not really limited uh, about really particular sound so you your perception is also where you are and you know even for example the case of a concert hall okay how you came to there and it's a, each person has a different experiences and you know it is uh, not the exactly the, the idea composer make some uh, idea and put it down to performer and go down to audience you know it's not like that and it's uh, composer cannot uh, control it and the performance cannot control it and also of course the audience cannot control it but it is sa the something happening among them um, and the idea of psychospecific music is uh, you know i compose a particular space and it basically it's uh use some particular aspect or particular character or of the space to into my music and basically it doesn't make sense other places and this is something opposite with the idea of modern music and something western music after 18th century so you know it's it's kind of a premise this symphony is always the same in the everywhere but it's not true. And sometimes I really felt it's important to really focus on some places. And also these site-specific compositions, the case of a site-specific composition, also this is my project to work with non-musicians and amateur musicians and to gather many people in some one particular places and make music together and just only once and maybe they bring something from that experience and they but they they have their own lives lives and this kind of you know it's i don't say it's a community because it's not it doesn't continue so long but you know some people and different back the people who had a different background and come together and do something in particular place and this is always very interesting experience for me i love it mm. yeah well i certainly <clears throat> i couldn't agree more with the the kind of network rhizomatic yes. kind of uh approach um to yeah. To, to musicking and that that whole kind of yeah that's that's de certainly something I subscribe to and and yeah it, it seems that site specific pieces they're yeah. they're really something that allow people to perhaps understand that and kind of lay bare that kind of um, perspective to to to, to musicking. Um, so finally so we're talking about the uh the kind of breaking down of that relationship between composer and interpreter and, mm -hmm. and, and audience mm -hmm. um but you've also interpreted yourself uh, <laughs> yeah. many works yeah. over the years um so yeah. works by john cage by Kristen wolf by Cornelius uh Cardew. um so i'm yeah i'm i'm curious to hear um how you approach so obviously it'll be different for each piece but um I'm curious to hear how you generally approach taking another artist's work um mm -hmm. and and looking how you'll uh how you'll look to interpret it sort of being on the other end of that uh kind of cue and and, and execution mm -hmm. actually I must say I'm a very serious person to consider about history and the when i play music actually not really we cannot escape from history and we have some responsibility it is uh, maybe a little bit sound too strict or digit i don't know but it's it is what i'm feeling and for example so i got many things from the music of john cage and his idea and also if 
I feel I want to understand what is it more to play it the best way. And okay, so the music of Chonggeji, okay, so it was played many places, but for example, if you see the, uh, yes, cardio, Korean's cardio, and so the, the, his piece, uh, the great running is, uh, very, very interesting piece. And I, I read many interesting things and the score I say is really interesting. But if you want to understand, you just should play it. And it is kind of a process for me. So it's a kind of a study because, uh, I didn't study piano or drums like such kind of thing, but I feel it's a kind of a responsibility for their music, their art and Play it and think about it, understand it. It's important. Hmm. And yes, and the performance is always joy. And okay, so you can run with joy. That is the best. Hmm. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think that historical kind of approach does isn't something that negates um, what you've been talking about. I think it's, um, yeah, it's something that embraces the kind of looking to understand the network mm -hmm. within which mm -hmm. the the piece resides and, mm -hmm. and 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 the ideas that have circulated around it and you know i think it's a it's an important aspect as well yeah you know it's uh, when i perform the piece of john cage okay so i can say i pretty understand very well who was him and what he taught, I read a lot, and but still, you know, it's uh, to play the music of John Cage is not obviously it's not to transport the, his idea to audience. It's another thing, and also John Cage, the idea is like that, and the composer made something and it was something that the he he prepared the field the prayer do something and it is not even prayer's expression not his expression but still something and what is it and to know what is it it's uh, just play it you know and it's the most effective efficient way and yes just do it Hmm. Well, I think that's uh, some very fine words to 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 finish on. I think uh, kind yeah. of <laughs> really, it synthesizes a lot of the things we've been talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, no, well, that was really interesting. Um, thank you so much, Tomomi. Um, yeah, welcome. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. Um, so as with all the podcasts, uh, yeah. everything that we've been talking about today uh, will be linked to and listed um, on the Flucoma Learn platform website, uh, which uh, uh, if you're if people are watching this on YouTube, you can find the link to that in the description and also on the various other podcast formats. Uh, you should be able to find that page very quickly. Um, so, Tomomi, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much. And I shall speak to you again soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.